Hello everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. We're back with another Fact Friday. So I'd like to start off by saying, rest in peace, Mr. Jim Dunlop. Those of you may know Jim Dunlop, those of you are the guitar players, obviously for picks. He was pretty revolutionary in the late 60s, early 70s, and he made all kinds of standardized picks that all of us use. In fact, a couple of my favorite guitar players, they use his picks, but they have their own signature versions. Um, also, I think the other thing about Jim that's really important to know is he rescued the Crybaby um, in the, I think, 1980, 81, something like that. The company had sort of disappeared, and there was like six months when nobody was making the pedal whatsoever. And he came along and, you know, got the, the contract to build them, or whatever the technical term is, and gave it a new lease of life. Um, you know, the, the cry, Crybaby, obviously, most famously, at least for me, is Hendrix, Voodoo Child, um, and tons of other stuff, but it, it sort of declined by late 70s, early 80s. So when he took over manufacturing that, that was pretty fantastic. And I remember being a kid and buying my first Jim Dunlop Crybaby and just being incredibly excited that I could do my bad versions of Hendrix. So he also did the same thing with MXR. He brought back their pedals in a big way in the 80s, and they became pretty much a household name. We have a couple of MXR pedals that we use quite frequently. I think the Distortion Plus and of course the Phase 90 are two of the greatest pedals ever made. They pretty much an industry standard sound. So he was definitely a lot more than just a pick manufacturer. So he will be sorely missed. And as a guitar player, it's just sad to know that a name like that um, has gone. Uh, there's a few of those guys and girls left and I wish them long lives. So thank you, Jim, for everything you did. So before we get going, please don't forget to subscribe. Hit the like button. It's really amazing when you hit that like button. I really appreciate it. And don't forget to comment and question below. We love this discussion. Regarding doubling vocals, are you talking about doubling the track or doubling the performance? Do you ever have a vocalist sing over a comped track? Yes, 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 and yes. I love to double performances. Um, yes, you can do the Haas effect. You can, you can double it, delay it, put some pitch on it, do all kinds of fun stuff. Of course, if you only had one vocal and you were mixing somebody else's track, you might resort to do something like that. However, I prefer to get the singer to sing it multiple times. What I'll typically do is record a few takes, build a comp, and then have the singer sing to the comp which is what you're asking me. And yes, I do that a lot. Also, quite frankly, if I can get four or five takes, maybe a bit more, six or seven takes, I can build two comps that work really, really well with each other and build a double right from the get-go. Some songs that you're thinking of that you realize from the get-go are going to be done as doubles, it, it takes some of the pressure off the singer because they know there's gonna be that double effect. I love it. It's a great, great sound on the right song, but I love doubling vocals. I sometimes write a song as I go, so recording parts like that, and then slowly building the whole song. Is this something you do as well, or do you always write beforehand, record, and maybe change things afterwards? That's another yes, yes, and yes. I mean, I, I do that all the time. I think a lot of the songs in the Academy even the full productions where I've gone into Sunset Sound and tracked like, you know, live drums and bass and keys and pianos and stuff. Even that, the essence of the song may well have been written and recorded here. So I'll start with me and the other musician, either with a keyboard or I'm usually on acoustic guitar, and we work out the arrangement of the song. Sometimes we're finishing writing the song, whatever it might be. But the next thing I always do is send that singer into the live room. They go into the live room and we put down the acoustic guitar and the vocal the day that we finished working on the song, either arranging or writing it, because that to me is the freshest time. It also gives you a really amazing, honest vocal because they've just finished writing those lyrics and it's fresh in their mind what it means. Now, there's a very famous story about a studio, I Have Harmony, um, where 
our old engineer and my old co-producer, Mr. Phil Allen, was working down there and Adele came in with Mr. Dan Wilson and Dan was playing piano and Adele was singing. And between them, they finished writing Someone Like You, which of course is a massive hit song, but they finished writing the song. So Dan smartly decided that he wanted to put down the song in a decent way, he even tempo mapped it. He sat there with Phil and figured out a couple of minor tempo changes, like a speed up in the chorus and a slow down in the verse put the click down, played piano to it. While doing one take, Adele sang. After finishing playing the piano, she sang twice more. Then they did a quick comp of like a verse from here, a chorus from there, a bridge from there, chorus out, whatever. The rest is history. It became a massive number one single in, I don't remember, 13 countries. The biggest selling song of, I think, of that decade. So, what is the moral? Well, the moral of the story is they just finished writing the song and Dan wanted to put down a decent sounding demo. Just to further the point, actually Rick Rubin then decided to do a full production of it and they did a full production of it. I'm sure it was amazing. They did the whole thing. Several months later, Adele sang on that. And the story goes that Adele sent the full production to her mother. And if you know anything about the song, the song is so remarkable. It's, it's a great idea. I think we've all felt this. You break up with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, husband, wife, whatever it is, and you want your next relationship to actually mirror that one. You might still be in love with that person. So you say, I want to find someone like you. It's not always vitriolic and hatred. Sometimes you just are still in love and you loved the, maybe that person's personality, maybe something special about them. So this song was very, very unique because it mirrored and echoed that kind of feeling. The reason why I talk about that is because she was in it. When she wrote that song, she was feeling those feelings. She really knew those feelings. So she sang that vocal, feeling those feelings. Then several months later, she comes to sing on what could be, I mean, I never heard it, but one of the most amazing productions. Maybe Rick Rubin had done a crazy, crazy string orchestration. Who knows? But to answer your point, the reason why the other one won is because she was in it and she was recording the song there and then. So I really, really, really highly recommend that as you're writing a song, when you get to a point where you feel pretty happy with the arrangement and the basic vocals, go in and sing it and put it down. You're gonna find it pretty hard to beat that, and that's a good feeling. And that, that may, I might carry on tracking here and finish the song up, or I might take that piano vocal or acoustic guitar vocal and go to a bigger studio and do a full massive production. Who knows, but the essence of that song for me, at least, in my experience of all the records I've made, that is usually the purest thing. And I have a tendency to always start with vocals and then build around it. I work in the exact reverse of the way most rock records are made, where it's like you track drums, you edit the schnizzle out the drums, you put a bass over dub, you edit that, you put some heavy guitars on, you pan them super wide, and then you sing over it. That's not how I work. Um, Eric is sitting behind the camera, will tell you 99% of the productions we do we have an acoustic guitar and a vocal. And we might go, hey, you know what? You're singing pretty good and you're in the song. So give us like two or three more takes and they'll get up and sing in two or three more takes. We'll comp it and then we'll actually work around it. And invariably, if it's not that just that final vocal that makes it, it's at least big chunks of that vocal because it's very hard to reproduce that moment again. Just ask Adele. How do you get rid of harsh S sounds when recording? but not backing the artist off the mic to the point where they're thin sounding. I think we talked about this before, the pencil trick. So you take your nice circular, you know, it doesn't have to be circular, but you take your pop screen and then you can tape a pencil over it. If you tape a pencil over it, it will split the air. It will also help with the S's as well. That's, that's a pretty good technique. Um, honestly, I don't know if the proximity on the S's, you know, you can be back here and still go, Shh and blow it out. It's not entirely because, I, I think there's definitely more low P's with the proximity. Um, so I don't, if I was having an excessive S, that's a nice word, excessive S. If I'm, have, if I'm having an excessive S, I'm not really thinking necessarily about the proximity as much. Um, I would make sure I don't engage any EQ. There's no reason to brighten it going in. I record my vocals flat. The only EQ I might engage is a little bit of high passing. If we're in a noisy environment, maybe there's some rumble, 
maybe there's some air conditioning noise. Otherwise, zero EQ, zero high passing, nothing, nada. I just print the vocal flat. So for me, if it's really, really excessive, it could well be a voice doesn't match the microphone. That happens all the time. Um, I was recording Jamie Hartman a few years ago. I'm sure you all know Jamie. He's a good friend of mine. Saw him last night. He wrote Rag and Bone Man. He's currently got some big number one. He's an amazing songwriter, but he's also an incredible artist. And I've told this story before, so excuse me, but I have a U48. I have a U47. We have C12A, whatever. We have a lot of really nice mics. And I put up the U48. This is the big mic, got lots of hit records. You know, I said all this stuff. He goes up to it and he goes, isn't gonna work for me. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he gets on the mic and it's like, psh, 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 psh. I mean, it's literally plosives and S's and everything. And it sounds dreadful. And I was like, how? I've never heard anybody make a 48 or a 48 make a vocal, more importantly, sound that bad. Um, so 47, 48 mm, did not work. You know what he said to me? He goes, an AKG 414 always sounds good on my voice. And at this point, of course, I believed him. So we stuck up a 414 and he was right. It sounded so smooth. Now, those of you who have used 414s, 47s and 48s will know that mix makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. There's no sense to that idea. You're like, well, if it didn't work on a 47 or a 48, why would it suddenly have no essing on the... The, the, the 414, everything around on the 414 would have the same issues, apparently. But that's the thing, we don't always know. We don't always know, you have to experiment. So my first thing would be, if you are getting excessive S's, yeah, try putting the pencil across it, see if that breaks up some of the and the whistling and the, and the P's and all that stuff. But if it's not that, try a different mic. Try a different mic. For instance, you know, condensers, um, can be super smooth on the top. Expensive ones usually are. The cheaper ones tend to be incredibly bright. Like a $300 and less condenser is insanely bright and it can rip your head off with brightness. So maybe, maybe try dynamic. Maybe try a different condenser. Experiment a little bit. But I think having one or two choices of microphones can really, really make things different. Because something like an SM7 or even a 57, and any kind of condenser are chalk and cheese. They're so different on vocals, but all of them work. So definitely try experimenting with microphones. The vocals I record are always piercing in the plus 7K range. I notch and DS, but the vocal ends up sounding dull. Any tips? I wouldn't notch and DS. Um, I would DS. Because remember, DS is like a, mo is, you know, a specific, like a single band, multi-band compressor. So it's only going to remove excessive high end when it peaks. I wouldn't notch it out because you're not trying to remove it all of the time. You're trying to remove it where it's excessive. That's where a DSer wins. So if you just take the most bog standard comes with your DAW, um, you know, DSer, let's just say you set your threshold here, Every time it's like it's jumping around there, you don't need to notch it. If you start to notch out some of the high frequencies, what's going to end up happening is you're going to make your vocal sound, like you said, dull. You just set the de so every time it comes up, it gets excessively bright. Then it just controls it and keeps it in the range of the vocal. My tip and trick that I love to do is I put a de first on a vocal, then I'll brighten it. Compress it maybe, but then I'll brighten it and then put another de on it. So it adds an air, an overall brightness to the whole vocal, but the de are run in series after EQs and compression. Sometimes I've got three on there, three de DS, compress, EQ, DS, maybe compress, but definitely EQ. And then maybe another de -esser. Who the heck knows? There can be at different points, but what they're doing is they're controlling those excessive high end that's gonna rip your head off. Don't notch it out. If you're notching it out, remember you're removing that all the time. You don't want to just like do a generic removal. That's why when I'm talking about, for instance, going back to my old you know, discussion from a couple of weeks ago, that's why I don't recommend notching frequencies out on your master bus. If you're having to pull out tons of frequencies on your master bus, go and find out where those problems are happening. It's the same methodology. Think about what is causing the problem and solve the problem. Don't put like, you know, don't hammer a freaking patch over it. 
go in there and surgically find the problem. And DSs are your friend. And they're variable multiband compressors. You can sit there on the high end and find it. And you can use three. Hey, try four. But the point is, brighten the vocal, find where it gets excessive, and then you'll get an airy vocal. But every time something whips a little bit too much, that DSer will catch the problem. So I hope you're enjoying it so far. Please don't forget to hit the like button, comment, subscribe, and go to Produce Like a Pro if you like, and sign up for the email list, get a whole bunch of free goodies. And you can also try out a free trial of the Academy. Would you ever split the vocal signal to get an unaffected signal as well as one through a compressor, high pass, et cetera? We talked about this before. I asked Shelly, I asked Shelly about the, the, the um, New York parallel processing and he looked at me like I was an idiot, like New York parallel com compression. I was like, yeah, I've read all these things about and he, Bear in mind, Shelly Ackers is one of the greatest engineers that ever lived and is from, you guessed it, New York and was there making records in the 60s and early 70s before coming out here and made some of the best sounding records of all time. And when I asked him about the New York compression, he didn't know what it meant. Now, the reason why I say that is because if you're gonna take a parallel compressor and EQ it really heavily, whether it's on a console or whether it's in the box, it can really mess with the phase. And I don't just mean, you know, because it looks like the phase is out on, in your DAW. I just mean it confuses the crap out of things because you've got maybe a vocal that doesn't have any EQ on it or has a different kind of EQ to a parallel one. And it just starts to fight. You know, sonically, it creates chaos. So I personally, when I parallel compress, I just duplicate it. So what I'll do is I'll take, you can do one of two things. What, but this is what I like to do is I maybe take the lead vocal, I put compression and EQ on it, and then I'll send it to a bus. And why I like to send it to the bus is because that bus might have a little soft compression on it. Then what you can do is you can take that bus, that auxiliary, that subgroup of the vocal and duplicate that, and then use the same compressor on it, but use it, yes, you guessed it, more aggressively. So then you're parallel compressing. Now you've got a vocal that's like, ah, you know, being like completely like tethered and like wants to explode. And you just turn that up underneath the main one. But the secret is, is that those two subgroups have identical plugins on them. That is a big deal for me. And the EQ is treated in the same way. That allows me to blend it and I don't have a fear of any kind of polarity or phase issues. Now, you're gonna get people arguing with that point and that's absolutely fine. I'm just telling you from my experience and the way that delay compensation works in various different DAWs, if I create two buses that have a single source and I use identical plugins on them, even if I'm using more or less compression on the other ones, it seems to me I don't get the sort of delay, compensation, you know, phasey, polarity, few samples out kind of trick. That's just me. Maybe I'm being superstitious, but it's always worked that way for me, but especially before delay compensation back in the 90s. That's what we all did. And it seems to always work. So, no, I don't usually EQ it any differently. So if I was brightening up a vocal on my sub, I duplicate it for my parallel, keep the same EQ. I just might use more compression so there's more energy and I just pull it up underneath. When you record vocal doubling or harmonies, do you use the same mic or different mics? One of the reasons why we are, we're big fans of the Lewitt LCT 940 is it, it has a tube and a FET side. And the first thing I noticed when I tried out that mic for the first time is, of course, I love the tube side. It sounded really beautiful. So the LCT 940, we set all the way over to tube. And then we thought, you know what? We're going to do some backgrounds. Why don't we go to FET? So we turned it, because it's continuously variable between tube and FET. So we turned it all the way back over to FET, did the background vocals. And the FET had like a little bit of a hardness sound where the tube had a little bit of a softness and an airiness. And it was miraculous. It made the lead vocals and the background vocals sit slightly different from each other. And it just saved us a schnizzle ton of work. So what am I saying? Well, that's just one mic giving you two different sounds. Remarkable, LCT 940. However, you're correct. What you're touching on is using two different mics can really, really help when it's the same singer. I tend to find in backgrounds, I wipe off the high highs and I wipe off the low lows. I high and low pass a bit. So maybe my lead vocal is pretty wide. 
Maybe it's got some 200 down there, not too much, but a little bit down there, you know, giving it some bit of girth. It's definitely got some 10, 11, 12 going on, you know, so the lead vocal's got this air. But I might take my backgrounds and maybe go up to three or 400 and then maybe not go much above five or 6K and just keep it just a little narrower so it's got more aggression in the mid range pushing forward and lets the lead vocal breathe around it. However, Obviously, you can do a lot of that by using completely different mics. So if you've got like a large diaphragm condenser, maybe that's your lead vocal sound, then maybe throw up a 57 or another or an inexpensive dynamic and do your backgrounds on that. I mean, to be honest, in a perfect world, it'd probably be something like a 47 and an RE20. Or if you can, get the LCT 940 because it's several mics in one. It's a pretty amazing mic. Anyway, yes, you're correct. Using different vocal mics can be really fantastic for separating lead and background vocals. How do you compress a vocal that is too dynamic? Normal voice, scream, normal voice, whisper. Um, looking for a lyric sheet. Here is a lyric sheet. It's got all my comp notes on it. And I've got stars and circles around stuff. Also, when I'm engineering, I have a lyric sheet here, got my lyric sheet. I'm sitting between a pair of speakers. I'm also sitting next to a mic pre. And with guys like Isaac Slade from The Fray, he, when he was young, very young, he had an incredibly dynamic uh, range, which is true of a lot of younger singers. As they get older, they understand better and better how to control their um, voices. So he would be like, you know, last and insecure. You found me, you found me. It was like, not to know. It was like this, all over the place. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten dB change. So, what did I do? Number of things, but the most important thing, and the reason why I have a lyric sheet, is I marked down words where he was wailing. And I also marked down words where he was like whispering. So I would like ring something, first time down. I just sit there with the gain. He's like, lost and lost and in, like, lost and insecure. Click down. You found me. You, but you know, you found me. Click up. You found me. Click down. And to be honest, I got used to clicking on my BAE 1073 and also taking the output gain and balancing it. Yeah, it's a little bit of work, but you know what? All good things are. If you want to make something amazing, it's a, a great attention to detail. I'm not hitting the gain too hard. I like my mic pre, as Joe Barisi often talks about, right on the verge of distortion. It's like you click up and you start to audibly hear distortion, click back one, it's still there, the gain's still there, it's still hot, but it's not, it's not crunching, it's just enough to get those electronics nice and warm, get, heat up those transformers nicely. I know that's not literal, but what I mean is just, you know, we love the sound of things kind of just on the verge of saturation. So, but when he wails, I click it down. So. Lyric sheets are your, really are your answer. Mark down where you have issues. And it can be a case of taking the gain and the output if you're going into compression and controlling it. Extra amount of work like that will give you the best possible results. That's the number one way I control dynamics on a singer. Younger guys and girls don't have very good mic technique and you can talk to them about moving away when they're screaming. But the point is, is they might not actually know. That's a reality. I've worked with thousands of singers. When they're young, they might not know how dynamic they are. They'll be like, I don't know why you can't be. They, they just don't know. It, it, and they're young and there is only a certain amount of control they can exert. They will get better and better and better and they will improve. And as their career grows, they will turn into a Steven Tyler who can come in and scream like this at this volume and then sing like this and then scream. A guy like him knows that. And if he's gonna really, really wail, he'll probably lean his head back just a little bit. That is a singer who's been doing this for the longest time. Younger singers are not gonna be that way. And you know what? It's okay. It is okay, it's our jobs as producers and engineers to capture great performances, not to lecture our artists on how superior we are. That's just ridiculous because some of the most talented singers in the world were unbelievably dynamic when they were young. And they worked with producers and engineers who got great performances out of them and helped them. That is our job. But anyway, 
I would say use the gain control and do a little bit of work, but make sure you have a lyric sheet so you know where those words and phrases are coming up that are going to be too dynamic. And working on stuff where the vocals are obscuring the attack of the kick. What to do? Ha, huh, interesting. You, you're obscuring the attack of the kick? Um, those vocals must be incredibly bright. Incredibly bright. Um, I, sh I can typically get a little snap at either 2.5, I want a more tr classic rock kick, or 7K and above if I'm going for like ultra metal. You know, I can get that without it ever obscuring the vocals. So I'd have to hear what you're doing, but ultimately it sounds like your vocal is probably so bright that any click that you're putting on the kick is kind of getting lost in that. It's the only thing I can think about. You should be able to get your vocal to be super big. The only other thing maybe is maybe you've narrowed your vocal so it's all just high, mids, and above. So what's happening is you're having to turn the vocal up to make it fit into the track. Don't yeah, allow the vocal to ha create a lot of room. You know, work, get a huge vocal sound, and make the band work around it. If you have to shave a bit of low mids and low end off the vocal, by all means do. But don't do it so much that you end up with like one can above. I've heard so many pop vocals in the last few years, they're literally all just says so time. It's pretty bad. I mean, they're like 1K to like 20K. I'm not kidding, maybe 700 hertz. And that could be a kind of an issue that you're having is because it's all in the high mids, maybe whatever you do with the kick drum tends to get eaten up by the vocal because that's all that's left of the vocal. I personally like my vocal to breathe, like a bit more low mids on it. Obviously, I don't want to hear 600 honk or anything or 450. I'll pull those frequencies out or, you know, multiband compress or dynamic EQ them out where they're excessive. But ultimately, um, you shouldn't have an issue with a kick drum and a vocal being in the same place unless there's not enough definition on the kick, number one. And secondly, the vocal is so bright that the kick gets lost in it. So uh, those are the two things I would think about. Once again, rest in peace, Mr. Jim Dumlop. Um, great, great name, great company. And uh, as a guitar player, it's a big loss. Please subscribe, hit the like button, um, go to Produce Like a Pro, sign up for the email list. And of course, you can join the Academy. It's absolutely amazing. Everybody's really incredible in that. And you will learn a schnizzle ton.